Most diseases that we deal with, a patient comes in with diabetes and we treat them every day for the rest of their lives. But there's a billion people out there that have diseases now, like diabetes where we can give them a new pancreas, or someone with renal failure, or someone that has a failed liver or a heart, that we can now replace that with regenerative medicine. So 10 years ago, I was in Washington at a meeting and was introduced to regenerative medicine. And the notion that there's a billion people around the world that we can now, when they come into our office, rather than giving them a treatment every day for the rest of their lives, we can give them a new organ. So I know that sometimes it's hard to understand what this means, so I brought a new organ with me. <laughs> now, I wanted this to be a kidney or a liver or a pancreas, but when I went to my anatomical model in my house, the best thing I could pull out that, that she or he would let me have was this. So this is what? So in the future, when you come in and you need an organ, and you're one of the one billion people that need an organ, we're going to make you an organ. So that's a story that I want to tell you today. So, so when we define regenerative medicine, it's a field where we can give you cells, tissues, or organs. And this field came from tissue engineering, which is a field I've been involved in for 40 years, where I was growing nerves and other tissues. So the notion is that we can take something like this rat and grow a human ear on its back. And that's tissue engineering, where we bring all these different people together, and we can take cells and create essentially any part of the human body. And the key to that are stem cells. And the major advance 10 years ago was work by this Japanese scientist who came up with the notion that we can induce any cell in your body and transform that cell into a stem cell. So prior to this work, we could take bone marrow, fat, skin, or a fetus, and we can harvest stem cells out of those tissues. Now we can take these induced pluripotential stem cells and essentially take any cell in your body and if we put it in the right medium, we can transform that cell into a stem cell and take that stem cell and then grow you your new stomach or liver or kidney or any organ you want. Even we could consider growing you a new hand or a face or skin after a burn. So here to understand these stem cells, Basically, a stem cell is an undifferentiated cell. It's a cell that can become any cell. It can become your heart, your nervous system, or your immune system. And once you take this undifferentiated cell, you can move this cell and make it into an adult cell that permanently becomes that new cell to become part of this organ. But there's more to making this organ than just that, because you need a framework for this organ and you need other biofactors to keep this organ healthy so that when I give it to you, it basically replaces a missing part and cures you of your disease. <coughs> so let's put all this together. What are the advantages of regeneration? You can create unlimited, undamaged organ availability. You can prioritize the patients, in other words, Typically, we will try to take a patient for a kidney transplant and pick someone young and healthy like you in the audience. But if you were 90 years old, you'd no longer be a candidate, and you'd be forced, for instance, to go under dialysis and live only a few years. So the whole priority changes with regenerative medicine in the sense that the priority now becomes anybody with a viable life can now become a candidate because we can take their cells and grow an organ and give them a new life expectancy. And rather than organ transplantation where the number of organs available are small and you require immune suppression, that all goes away because now the organ availability is unlimited. And no longer do we need to put you through immune suppression because the cells that we put back in you that make that organ are your cells. So let's give you an example of a friend of mine who's a 90-year-old who we discover that he needs his aorta replaced. So that gets replaced. 
in an operation, now possible. 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been. Turns out he has an aortic valve that's also failing, and that's also replaced, all done by going through the groin and replacing it. But during these procedures, there's enough dye that's given to the patient that his kidneys fail. So now he's going to be on dialysis and last a few years, and he's going to then die unless we can give him a new kidney. So we have to sort of make him a new kidney, a custom kidney for him. Now, of course, it won't be a stomach, and it'll look a little bit more like this, so you're all wrapped up in plastic, ready to go. So how do I fabricate this for him in a month? So that's the story. So he wants to come in. We're going to study him and say, all right, we're going to make him, VB, a new kidney and ship it to him wherever he is and then put it in. So this is the story. I had a hard time finding one of these. So this does look a lot like an ace wrap. But imagine this <laughs> in the future as a kidney. So. There's a limit. I spent a lot of time in clinic getting everybody running around trying to find what it looked like a wrapped kidney would look like. But. So first, you need to make a model of that kidney. And it doesn't have to be an exact shape model, but it has to be a model that models the blood vessels that we're going to attach to. So a company I helped start back in the early 90s is called M2S. It's located down here uh, by the airport in Lebanon. And they can model your body, and here you see a picture of kidneys being modeled, and they can give you the exact model of where the vessels are that you're going to connect the kidney to. Because at some point when we make this kidney, we're going to want to put it in the body and then basically attach it, snap it in place to the vessels. So here you can see these 3D models of a liver, kidneys, and even lungs. So any of these models have been made, and this company has made about 300,000 or so models of the body to help us when we treat patients uh, endovascularly, meaning going up through the groin and being able to either replace the aorta or aortic valve. But that modeling capability using computers now allows us to model and fabricate a new organ. So now what we need to do is go to this patient, harvest some cells, and because of that work done by that Japanese scientist, we can essentially harvest any cell in the body, and we can put that cell through a process and induce it to become a stem cell and then transform it because when we make a kidney, the kidney may be made up of three or four different types of cells and we have to make a batch of each of these cells so we can put them together to manufacture a new kidney and really transform or do this paradigm shift in medicine. So rather than treating him with dialysis, we're going to cure him with a new organ. So we're going to process this at a processing plant. Now this could be Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. It could be this new facility the government's building down in Manchester with Dean Kamen to manufacture organs. That was money given out last year. Or it could be anywhere around the world. There's centers like this being built in Toronto, in London, to build these organs in Israel, Japan, Singapore. And what we want to do is create a scaffold or a structure. So not only do we have the cells, but we're going to have to somehow print those cells into a structure, a scaffold, a framework. We have this notion of 3D printing, and everybody's heard about 3D printing. But now instead of 3D printing to make a box or some kind of toy, we're going to 3D print into a framework and put cells in in the right order of cells for vascular, cells for filtration, all the different cells the kidney has into the right framework to build a kidney. Now, we've been building these one at a time in laboratories, but now the government's funding us to manufacture these in large numbers. So we would use these fancy 3D printers and essentially grow the organ for the patient, a specialized organ just to that patient's need. And then we need to preserve it. So here we see this preserved one. It's all wrapped up, ready to go in its little plastic. So you're going to have to build it somewhere, let's say in Manchester, and the patient may be in Florida. And then you'd put it into this little container and ship it by FedEx or DHS or whatever. It would arrive, and then the surgeons down there would put it in. Like kidney transplant surgeons, they would put it in. But in this case, they order it 
and a few weeks later or a month later it arrives and they put it in place. And to put it in place, they would use a robot. So instead of doing a big operation where they open the patient up, they would take one of these and they would make a small incision. They would put it through the incision and the robot would put its arms in the patient and the robot would then know the anatomy precisely from those 3D models we made. This would have little vessels coming off of it, which the ACE wrap doesn't have, and those would then get plugged in. So the operation to put this in place might take only 40 minutes. So taking a 90-year-old, we've already given him a new aorta, we've already given him aortic valve, and now we would plug in a new kidney or any part that he needed to essentially cure his disease. But what about monitoring it? The FDA is gonna be very concerned about whether this is gonna fail or not. So when we build an organ versus a transplant an organ, we can embed microsensors all through the organ. And these microsensors can send information out to the FDA and the doctors. So they'll know day by day, minute by minute, second by second, how this organ's functioning. And they'll know if it's failing to put the patient back on dialysis, or if the organ needs to be removed, they can remove it and put a new one in. And I put um, up there uh, submarines, because if you don't know <clears throat> all that data that we worry about all the time, by companies like Google and Microsoft, they're afraid of that data being attacked, so they're actually putting it on submarines in the ocean right now, which is pretty wild, although we don't talk about it much. So where did this get us? What's the summary of this for this friend of mine who's 90 that would have died without an organ like this? And in his case, he actually recovered. So in one month, we could fabricate an organ. There would be unlimited supply, so anybody that needed an organ would be able to get the organ. There'd be no immune suppression because that organ would be made out of that patient's own cells. We could put it in using a robot so it's a minimally invasive operation that would only take an hour or so. So there's less surgical and medical risk. So this will be a truly a paradigm shift in our lifetime over the next decade or so. And the government just spent in the last 10 years $200 million developing this technology for the wounded soldier and now is given another several hundred million dollars based in Manchester as a ward last year to start looking at how do we go from one organ, as I started with, like this, to producing thousands of these so that everybody in the audience can have their organ made and ready to go. So thank you very much for your time. I wanted to give you a look in the area of medicine at a major paradigm shift that's happening right now around us, sponsored by the government and happening in countries around the world so we can look at how we go from treating disease where you get medication every day to essentially curing disease where that's it, you come in, you get your organ, and you're better. Thank you very much.